Your name wrong? Yes, but it's okay. <laughs> I knew it. I asked even my wife, I said, how do you spell Alan? And she, she said, why don't you Google it? <laughs> I said, you know, I don't have time to do that, but I'll take my chances. <laughs> so it is A-L-A-N. A-L-L-A-N. I was close. So there's only one, only one missing. I'm sorry, brother. It's you can always put a little dot to it. So brother, Pastor Alan Esses is in our midst. And I want to tell you, he's a special man. He's very instrumental in the day of prayer, our International Day of Prayer. He advertises that day. He makes sure that it's passed all over the world, etc. And Pastor Alan Essis is a wonderful speaker. We want to welcome him. We want to pray that he be used in our midst. And I want you to give him with me a great round of applause, him and his family. Amen. A wonderful man of God and a dear really like family to us and just blessing to be here with all you wonderful people and uh, Paula and the family uh, what a joy as uh, let's just bow our heads before the Lord in prayer Father we enter your gates with thanksgiving with joy in our hearts that we've been washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ we've been born again by the spirit of the living God so, Father, we just come before your throne of grace. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to the church today. That you, dear Father, and your, your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified as we study God's Word. So, Father, just pour out your Spirit upon me. Give me a gift of teaching that I would bring forth only those things that you would want me to speak this day. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for Dr. Ray. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and my family, Natasha and Rebecca. And uh, we just love them and their family so much and this wonderful body of Christ. So we give you the glory. We pray for the rapture of the church and for the peace of Jerusalem. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Boy, what a joy to be here. I was praying of what I was going to... Uh, with the, I pray the Lord would want me to share with you today. And uh, one of the things, uh, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Peter. The name of the, the message today is, What Time Is It? What time is it on the prophetic clock, so to speak? Where are we in reference to what God has said in His Word? And I'm going to, if it's it's okay with 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 uh, Pastor Ray, Doctor Ray, I'm going to ask uh, the um, starting in, in in Second Peter, starting in verse 11 through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to read the first verse 11, and you can read the alternate verse. Uh, and and if you could stand as we read God's word. I would appreciate that. Second Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 11 to the end of the chapter. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, you, you, you can therefore not be negligent, negligent to put you always in remembrance, remembrance of these things, things though you know, know them as them established in the present truth. truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing, knowing that, that shortly I must put off my tent, even as our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ showed, showed me. me. Moreover, I will be careful to endure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of and coming of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ that were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, 
which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the dawn, the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this verse, First. no prophecy or description is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you so much for the precious word of God, for the prophecy that you have put in your word. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. And bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. It continues in, in chapter 2, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on them, themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the word of truth is blasphemed. I love... God's word. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Today we're going to talk about what time it, it is. What time it is during the prophetic time clock, so to speak. Today we look around the world and we see the Middle East in turmoil. We see in many cases brother against brother, sister against sister. We see the, uh, the uh, persecution of Christians in Egypt, in Lebanon, in the Sudan, all throughout the Arab world, various parts in Indonesia, uh, so many parts, and even in this great country of America. Christians are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And we look and sometimes I hear people say, well, what is going to happen to us? Where are we? I see the, the sin that abounds among us. You, you look at it and you see people being killed, women being raped, the stealing, the, the, the sin that just abounds. Sometimes young people worry about, well, what's going to happen to me in, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years if the Lord should tarry? What's going to happen to us? Where do I look to find the answers? How do I know what will become of me, of my family? And so God in his kindness and love has provided us answers through his word. God does not want us to be worried we are to be anxious for nothing in the book of Philippians. We are to know God's word. Jesus uh, rebuked the Pharisees and the people for not being able to discern uh, the times in which he first came. We also as Christians should not be caught as a thief in the night. We should be looking for the, the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus said, gird up your loins, be ready. I come at an hour you think not. And so there are things in the Word of God that God wants you to know that will encourage you. That God does have a plan. That God does love you. And so today we're going to talk about the times in which we live and how these, these times will affect us. The Bible does talk about the end times. Many churches today do not deal about prophetic things. They do not deal about prophecy because prophecy sometimes is very difficult to understand because you need to understand the full counsel of God's Word. You need to read from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Paul said, I haven't shunned to give you the full counsel of God's Word. And many churches do not deal with prophecy. They don't, well, I, it's, it's too difficult. Uh, it, it's, uh, it could be argumentative. But Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. My word is truth. 
and the truth shall set you free. If you do not understand prophecy, you do will not understand the full counsel of God's word. More than one-third of God's word is prophecy. More than one-third of God's word is prophecy. So if you do not understand God's word, how can you rightly divide the word of truth that God requires us to do? You need to read fully through God's word. From Genesis through Revelation. To see what the Holy Spirit would say to your heart. We read in first in Second Peter, and he talked about that we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. They had seen Jesus Christ. They beheld him as the only begotten of the Father. But, but, the, but the Apostle Peter said in verse 19, We also have the prophetic word made more sure, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The prophetic word of God sets Christianity apart from every other religion on the face of the earth from, all, from time immorium. God's word, prophecy of what was going to happen. God said, I'm going to tell you what is going to happen so that you will know that I am God. That you can rest that what God's word, what he said is going to happen is going to be true. The most of the major religion or the major major religions they don't deal with prophetic things. They do not. God said, "I'm going to have my son Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who would be born in the flesh, would be born in Bethlehem." We can prove that prophetic event. We know that his he would go into Egypt. Again, prophetic. We can test God's word. The entire veracity of God's word is based upon the prophetic word of God. So that I would know and I would have a faith and a hope through Jesus Christ. His son would be born. He would talk about where he would go, what he would do, how he would die, and he would be bodily raised from the dead. And by faith in him, as Dr. Ray said, we would have eternal life. We would not perish. So we have a hope in Jesus Christ. The prophetic word of God. So the book of Revelation, for example, is a prophetic book. Almost all of it is prophecy of what would happen in the future. You need to understand God's word. Now in the book of Revelation, I believe there's about 400 references relating to the Old Testament. So you need to know all of God's word. Now, what is prophecy? Prophecy is the foretelling of events that will occur in the future. Okay? I'm, God said, I'm going to tell you, and we're going to see that in a few seconds, so that you will know that I am God. There is no, no other one like me. There are two major areas of prophecy. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he said, the volume of the book speaketh of me and the nation of Israel. Those are the two main areas of prophecy in the Word of God. As I said, the, the Bible is more than 30 percent, uh, more than one-third is prophecy. Mo many or most of the prophecies have already been fulfilled. We can see archaeological uh, discoveries, we can see historical discoveries proving that God's Word is true. We saw the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1948 in Quram. Uh, and and, and it, sh it had all the books of the Bible except the book of Esther. But it was word for word of the Jewish Bible that they have today. That pre predated Jesus Christ by 200 years. When people say, well, the Bible has been changed. I, how can I believe in the Bible? The Dead Sea Scrolls, by God's grace, has allowed the, the proof that God's word is true. That the Bible, the Hebrew Bible that, that they have and the Bible that we have, which was translated from the Hebrew, is true. God's word is true. 
We can test it, as I said, for Jesus Christ and where he was born, how he would die. Psalm 22, Micah 5, 2, 9, 6, Isaiah. We can check, we can check it and test it through God's word. All the things that the Bible said would come true has come true. If God said it, he said, I will bring it to pass, for I am God. Prophe prophecy reveals God's plan in advance. I took that from someone. I don't remember who it was. Prophecy reveals God's plan in advance. It tells you that if you've given your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that the blood of Christ will wash away your sins, that you, by your faith in Jesus Christ alone, who He is. What is the gospel? The gospel is that there is one God eternally existent in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone who was ever born was a sinner, except Jesus Christ, God Almighty, uh, who, who had no sin. All of you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we need to repent of our sins and turn to God, ask for forgiveness of, of, of our sins. God loves you. He showed that love through Jesus Christ upon the cross. So there is God, God's Son, Jesus Christ, came to die on the cross for your sins, my sins, and the sins of the world. As uh, Dr. Ray said, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever shall believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The promise and the hope, the prophetic promise of God for all of those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God's Son, would die on the cross and shed His precious blood upon the cross for your sins and my sins. Your, the blood of Christ washes away your sins. I am forgiven because I've given my life to Jesus Christ. He was then crucified, died on the cross, and then He was buried. And three days later, he was bodily raised from the dead. By faith in him alone, you have eternal life. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not by works, but by faith in who he is and what he's done. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am the Messiah, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh, you are not saved. You must believe that he is God who came in the flesh, the Son of God who would die for your sins. If you do not believe that he's bodily raised from the dead, you are not saved. If you believe you're going to work your way to heaven, your works is our filthy righteousness as before the Lord. You're saved because you've put your faith and your trust in God's only begotten Son who would die on the cross for your sins and be bodily raised from the dead. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've given my life to Christ. He's washed me by his blood and I believe that he is God who came in the flesh and I, I trust him for my salvation. That is the gospel. That is what we need to share with our family and our friends. The whole gospel of, of, of truth. You're saved by belief in the gospel. Not part of it, not five, not ten, not twenty, not forty, not sixty. Well, I don't want to believe in the resurrection. No, 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 I, I don't want to believe he's really God in the flesh. Oh, he's a good man, he's a prophet. No, he is God who came in the flesh. And you must believe that with all your heart. He said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You are not forgiven. You're, you must believe that Jesus is God. You must believe in the, in the resurrection. If Christ is not ra risen, your faith is futile. It has no value. That he's still in the grave. In the grave he cannot heal you. Those who believe that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. Most of you know what I'm referring to. 
He died on the cross for your sins. That's love. That's a God who loved you and willingly gave himself for you and for me. That's the gospel that is under attack right now. But all of those things were prophesied within God's word so we can go back. Yes, he'll be born in Bethlehem. Yes, he'll die for the sins of, 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 of this world. Yes, he'll be raised from the dead. You know that by reading God's word. And therefore I have faith. I have hope. No matter what's happening in the world around me, I have faith in Jesus Christ. And it's as, as Peter said, it is the prophetic word made more sure. Prophecy is from God. Prophecy comforts you. Comfort, I see it. I see the archaeological, I see the history, I see my changed life in Jesus Christ. I am encouraged by what I see. True prophecy is from God. It gives you comfort and it draws you closer to Him. Very important. Now, in, let's go to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 46. This is important because when you are in the world today, and, and, and many of you know the, the Bible is under attack. Well, the Bible's been changed. It's, been, it's this, it's that. Oh, you don't have the full, full completed word of God. I've just shown you through the Quran, uh, the, uh, Quran where they found the, the, the scriptures, every single word, the book of Isaiah, word for word, line for line, it is in God's word. They can prove that it was written 200 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 46... In verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the beginning, the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Standing, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. In verse 11, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. God said it. He is going to bring it to pass. He said, my son is going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay, he's going to die on the cross. I said it. I am going to bring it to pass. Look at Isaiah 48, 16. God is talking. Someone says, well, where's the Trinity? Where's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit within, within the Old Testament? Let's look at um, uh, verse 15. I... Even I have spoken, yes, I have called him, I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. Who was there from the beginning? God. God is talking here, isn't he? What is it said? I have not spoken from, uh, in, in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. Unto us a, a child is, is born, unto one, us a son is given. The Lord God, the Father, and his Spirit have sent me. It is God who's talking. Jesus Christ is God. This is a proof, positive text about that Jesus Christ would come to this earth sent by the Father, sent by the Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God eternally existent in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one. Now I'm encouraged when I read this. Prophecies, I said, encourages you. It edifies, it lifts up. So that we would know that what we believe in is true. And the truth shall set us free. Now, also, I want to go 
to um, in Matthew 22. Why do people have false doctrine? It's because they don't study God's word. In Matthew 22, 29, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. You have erred, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Why do you have false doctrine? Why do you not know the truth? Why is because you are not know the scriptures or the power of God. You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You need to know God's word. You need to be men and women of, of the word, men and women of prayer. I love the ministry for the International Day of Prayer to proclaim that Jesus Christ to the Arab world and, and, and to the United States because it's based upon prayer and the word of God. And that's why you see God moving in such a powerful and mighty way. For His glory. For people who are dead in their sins and need a loving, caring Savior, God who came in the flesh, Jesus Christ. That's what everyone in this world needs. Because there will come a time when, when there will be the worst tribulation this world has ever seen. Now, as I said, that Paul said in, in Acts 20, I have not shunned to declare to you the full counsel of God's word. We need to do that. Now, I'd like you to look, the next thing that we're going to look at as we continue to go to Matthew 22, and I, I want, this is a very important thing, very important. In verse 32 it says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That to me is very powerful. Now, I said we're going to do prophecy a little, so I, I brought my chart so I better use it. Here is the birth of Jesus Christ. This is Christ. Um, Christ died on, on the cross for our sins, was bodily raised from the dead. On the day of Pentecost, the whole, it was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and then he rose from the dead, bodily rose from the dead. Fifty days later was the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down upon the church. Many believe that is the beginning of the church age. We are now in the, in the midst of the church age. It is between Daniel and 9... Dan, I can't do it right now uh, because it's, it's very long. In Daniel 9.27, it deals with the 69... Uh, 24 through 27, it deals with the 69th and 70th week. We are in the 70th week of Daniel. A week in the Bible is a seven-year period of time. As, as Jacob uh, uh, served for Leah, Leah and Rachel, it's a seven-year period of time. But, so, the 69th, 70th week of Daniel, um, the church age. We are now in the church age and then the 70th week comes. But, uh, so we are in the church age right now that started in the, uh, book, of, uh, the book of Daniel. All right, Church age. The church age, when will the church age end? The church age ends at the rapture of the church. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, in verse 13 uh, through 17, in 1 Thessalonians, we see that, I, I, I love this, um, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, uh, go, go to verse 17, if you could, okay. Um, that we are alive and remain, shall be caught up in the, in the air, to meet him in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we, we shall ever be with the Lord. What's the next verse? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Prophecy, as I said before, comforts you. 
The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ at this particular point could come at any particular moment. He could come even as we are here in this church today. The dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive will be caught up to meet in, in, in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. I'm a Christian, born again by the Spirit of the living God. One day Jesus Christ, if he doesn't take me home first, will come for his church and will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Look at, look at John chapter 14, where it says, I go and prepare in my Father's house of many mansions. I go and prepare a place for uh, for you, and, and then I will bring you and catch you up. Same word, you know, raptoro, I, yeah, harpazo, but I won't go into that. But right now, uh, but you will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ for all eternity, the rapture of the church. So that would end the, end, end the church age. We then have a seven year period of time, which is the tribulation period. But I want to talk about the, the, the remaining time that I have. Uh, Lord willing, I'll, I'll come back and I'll, I'll finish the rest of the chart. But we are in the church age. One of the things in the church age, let's go to Matthew 24, very quickly. I'm not sure how much time I have left. But um, if I'm going too fast, please forgive me for that. Um, Jesus, um, this is the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? I believe we're in the end of the age before Jesus Christ will be coming back. We're going to see that in, in a few seconds. And Jesus answered and said to him, to them, take heed that no one deceives you. The church age, the end of the church age, the church of Laodicea in, in Revelation 3 is an age of deception. You have many people out there, you look at the churches and you see the compromise within the church of doctrine. Uh, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. The word of God isn't true. They changed the word of God. Jesus Christ is not God who came in the flesh. Uh, Second Peter, where is the promise of his coming? It's an age of deceit. It's an age of deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. It is an age of falling away. The Bible does not talk about a revival in the last days. It talks about apostasy. It talks about false prophets that Jesus is going to talk. It doesn't say it's going to be a, 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 a tremendous re worldwide revival. It's not going to be a kingdom that's be going to be created on this earth until later. We'll come to that at the next time. But let's look what he says. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. We're not to be troubled. We're to be com comforted by the prophetic word of God and the promises of, of God through Jesus Christ for each one of us who have given our lives to Christ. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and the earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. What do you see in the world today? You see earthquakes. You see diseases which are pestilences. You see all the things that Jesus said that these are the beginnings, either the birth pangs knowing that he's coming soon. Then I'm going to go to verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house, and let him who is in the fields not go back. Woe to you who are pregnant. Um, okay, that are with child and to them give suck in those days and then it says and pray your flight may not be in the winter or in the Sabbath okay the Sabbath day what does that tell you who is Jesus talking to Jews absolutely he is talking to the Jewish people 
They would be the ones who are there would be concerned about fleeing on the Sabbath. Today, one of the major issues in this world is who does the land in the Middle East belong to? Who does it belong to? Was the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or was it made to Abraham, to Ishmael? We read in Matthew 20, 22, 29 and through that, that it's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In Genesis, we're going to go through that. Uh, Doctor, just tell me if I have about five minutes or seven, whatever it is. Let's go to Genesis for a second. You err not knowing the scriptures. How many of you believe that the land belongs to the Arabs and the Palestinians? You have to raise your hand. How many of you believe that it belongs to the Jewish people? Okay. Let's see what the Word of God says. We are responsible with what God's Word says. Not what we think, not what we want, is what God's Word has said. We go to Genesis chapter 12. It says in chapter 12, verse, verse 1, Get out of your country for your kindred. Uh, Okay, now Lord said to Abraham, get out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make you a great nation. Uh, thee a great, and I will bless thee and, I, and, and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the, of the earth be blessed. Now the question is, that's true, that is Abraham. Okay, but what does God's word say in addition to that? Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter, one second my dear friends, chapter 13. How many believe that the Bible is the word of God? You all do, right? Therefore, we're going to... The Bible says in Acts 17, 11, they search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are so. I, as a Christian, I'm going to go back to God's word, the full counsel of God's word, and I'm going to test what any pastor, what, what I say or anyone else, so that I will know what God's word says. This Bible, the Hebrew Bible, was written 200 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Archaeologically, historically proven to be true. What you have in your hands, what we have here, is the absolute word of God. And we were responsible for what it says. Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, um, separated, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which I see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Okay? Now, at this particular point, you could say, well, it could be Isaac or Ishmael. Is that correct? Okay. But God does not stop there. Let's go to um, chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 18. To your descendants I have given the land from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, so on and so forth. Uh, the next uh, verse through 21. These are the lands that God has given to the children of Israel. Now, the map today of Israel is this little small piece of land. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you to all the way to the river Euphrates, which is in, which is in Iraq. Jesus said, are these things so difficult to understand, to hear? This is God's word. 
They're fighting over this little piece of land. But God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this, all of this land. And you'll see it, it, it goes all the way north and it goes also to, to, the, to the east and to the north. Let's just keep on going. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Abraham loved his son, Ishmael. He loved his son. Abraham sinned against God when he went into Hagar rather than into Sarah because God had promised him that, that from his seed the nations of the world would be blessed. And that seed would come Jesus Christ through all the nations of the world would be blessed. But God, but, but he loved Ishmael. Genesis 17, 7. And he says, I will establish my covenant between you and between you and your descendants after you in these generations for an everlasting covenant to be to, to God and to your descendants after you. What does the word everlasting mean to you? Forever. Forever. It's not for five years, ten years, a thousand years, two thousand years. It is forever. That's what it says. Now, in verse 8. Uh, and I will be, also I'll give you the descendants after you, the land from which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan. Now this is all the land of Canaan. All the way into the sea. And an and everlasting possession and I will be their God. Now let's go to verse in um, 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her, her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be the name. And verse 16, And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations, king of peoples, and, she, and shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? This next, next one. And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Next verse. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. For much of the world, these are difficult words to hear. But they are God's words. And they are truth. For God's word is truth. I will sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said. So here it is. He says... This touches me. The covenant has gone to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Confirmed also through the New Testament in the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans. We'll come back to Genesis. So just give me a couple more minutes. I appreciate the time. Romans 9. And in Romans 9, it says in verse 7. It says, Nor are they all children, uh, because they are of the, of the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. From the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as you see in the New Testament, will come the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Next, next verse, if you could, please, sir. That is that which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. God's plan was to use Abraham and he would go into his wife, Sarah. That was God's plan. Abraham thought he knew better. 
When you look at the scriptures, for 13 years, God did not speak to Abraham again because he had sinned against God. He did not believe that, 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 that he would be, Sarah would be able to give birth because of her age. He disobeyed God. But God is faithful to his word. He said, through your seed, through Abraham, through Isaac, the nations of the world will be blessed. The land we're going to see in just one second was given in the scriptures to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through Moses, through David, through Jesus Christ, through the prophets. That is what God's word says. We are responsible from what God says, not what we think. Not what we want, but what God has said in His Word. And that's the issue. The issue in the Middle East is not, politic, it, it, it is not politics, it's religion. If the Bible is true, then the Quran is wrong. If the Quran is right, then the Bible is wrong. That's the issue. That's why Israel must be destroyed, must be put into the sea. Because then the Bible would be incorrect. And we're going to see in one second the promise established again through Abraham and Isaac. It even says so in the book of Romans. Go to the book of Galatians if you could for a second. It, it, I'll just read this in Romans. Uh, it says... Um, for this is the word of promise at the time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. In Galatians chapter 4. Notice how the word of God all comes together like a thread from Genesis through Revelation. That's so that we know there's no inconsistency within God's word. And that should encourage you. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. And I'll just finish in a couple of seconds. I didn't know what to... Uh, okay. Um, verse 21. Let's see. 4. Okay. Tell me that you desire to be in the Lord, that you not hear from the, lo from the law. Let's see. Okay. Verse, verse 22, please. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. Next verse. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but of the free woman was by promise. Abraham went into Hagar. Ishmael was a child of the flesh. The promise was from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go to verse 23. Here we have verse 24. For which things are symbolic, uh, allegory for these are the two covenants, one from the Mount Sinai, which is gendereth, to bondage, which is agar. Okay, now let's go to verse 28. We'll, we'll just, please forgive me for skipping a couple. You can go quickly. Now we, brethren, as Isaac were, are the children of promise. Verse 29. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And that's what you see in the Middle East right now. This is prophecy. This is God's word by the Apostle Paul written almost 2,000 years ago that God who was born after the flesh will persecute him who was born after the Spirit and so it is even now. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, would be born in Bethlehem from a Jewish mother because conceived by the Holy Spirit, God who came in the flesh, and would come again to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. If the Jews are no longer there, then Jesus Christ would not be able to come to the Mount of Olives. Now, in verse, and then it says, verse 29, if you just, um, let's see, verse 30, let's see. Um, Nevertheless, what the scriptures say, the scripture, cast out the bomb woman and her son, for the son of the 
bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Ishmael is not a joint heir with Isaac. That is God's word. And so, um, verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So often, Abraham wanted to help God. Let me, let, let me help. I, Sarah won't give birth. I'm gonna, let, let me go into Hagar, Sarah said. We need to be obedient to what God has said. Very quickly, just go to Genesis again. We are in the church age. The Apostle Paul said, has God cast off his people who he foreknew? The answer was, certainly not. If God can break his covenant to the to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then his word to you as Christians, that you have been born again by the Spirit of God, you have everlasting life because you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have no doubt, you have doubt in your mind that it would be true. God said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen and, and so that you can believe it and trust in it. So if he breaks his, his, his word to the Jews, that, then he could break his word to us. But God never breaks his word. He is always faithful to his word. This is important in these final days. Genesis 26. Speaking to Isaac in verse 2, 3. It says, And the Lord appeared unto us, Go down into thee, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee thereof. So I will be and bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. I will give you all these countries and I perform it the earth which I swear unto Abraham thy father. If you go to verse 1 you'll see that it's Isaac. Please go there brother. Verse because one. verse 1. It is important that we, we see that he's speaking to Isaac. And Isaac went out to Abimelech king of the Philistines unto Gerah. So here we see the covenant confirmed through Abraham and now being confirmed to Isaac. Go, um, let's go to verse 4. I was swore to verse 2 and verse 4. Unto, okay. And I will make thy seed to multiply of the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seeds all the countries, and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Okay. So here we see confirmed through Abraham and Isaac. Remember, the blessings is because of Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 28. God said to the Jewish people, to Moses, I chose you not because you were the most, but because of you, you were the least. So I could show my love upon you. To show God's power, he shows the least of us. Not the most. Not the biggest, the strongest. So he could show his glory. In chapter 28, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Uh, let's go then to verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of thy father and the God of Isaac and land whereon thou liest to thee I will give it and to thy seed. Verse 14. And there she shall be the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in, the, in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This goes through all the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. We need to know God's word. We need to have a reason for the faith that lies within us, a, a defense for the faith that we based upon God's word. Not what we think, but what God has said. It is, it is important. I'm going to just read one last thing. Go to Zechariah. Let 
Let me, let me explain something. Jesus Christ died for every single one. He died for every single Jew and Arab and, and Indian and um, for, for me, for you, for everyone. And he loves everyone. His desire is none to perish, but all to come to repentance. All to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Because He loves us and He wants all of us to be with Him. The plan of God for anyone who would come to Him. In Zechariah, and Dr. A, please forgive me for taking so long. <coughs> Chapter 8. These are prophecies in the end times. And it talks about in verse uh, in Zechariah, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal and with great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion. Jesus Christ in Zechariah, I believe chapter 4, he is going to rebuild the temple on the temple mount. But first, the Antichrist will do that the next time. We'll build a temple. Okay? And they'll build a wall between the holy and the profane. The dome on the rock says that God does not beget and God has not begotten. Uh, uh, that, that there is not a son of God whose name is Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty. That is blasphemous to God. This is his son who he gave and sent to die on the cross for our sins. And so there's going to be a war, which I'll, the next time, Lord willing, when I come, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the book of Revelation, a couple of things, where it talks about that, that, there's, that there will be between the two. But there, and then Jesus Christ will build a, another temple. But he said, I will return to Zion. The Lord says, I will return and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, in verse 3. Verse 4, old men and old women shall see, sit again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with a staff in his hand because of great age. In verse 6, if it is the Lord of hosts, if it is mar marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of the people in these days. Now, in verse, verse 7, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east, which is the actual translation, the land of the rising sun. Okay. Okay. Last verse, and then we'll pray. In verse, in Zechariah 8, verse 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all languages of the nations and shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go f with you, for we have heard that God is with you. All Jerusalem, all Israel will be saved in the book of Romans. But as we end today, I know I, there was a lot a lot to think about, a lot to pray about, a lot to search the scriptures. When Dr. Ray was gracious enough to pray with me before I came here, he talked about a reconsecration of our lives before the Lord. God loves you. He died for you and rose from the dead. For those who have never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or those who do not know him or not know if you're saved, God wants to forgive you. And so I would pray that if, you, if you're not sure, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you will be saved. I just end in prayer. If you're not sure, you've heard the gospel today. Jesus is God, came in the flesh, died for your sins, rose from the dead by faith in Him alone, have eternal life. So I'd ask you to bow your heads before the Lord. And if you're not sure, you want to reconsecrate your lives to Jesus Christ, God wants to wash away your sins, forgive your sins, because He loves you. So I ask you to repeat with me to receive Jesus Christ in your heart and to reconsecrate your lives to Him. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. Please forgive my sins.
I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart God raised him from the dead. I commit my life to Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I ask Jesus into my heart today. In the holy name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Father, just thank you and bless this wonderful church. Thank you for Dr. Ray and these wonderful people who have been so great.